Its influence is floundering overseas as part of the world it formerly held in its iron grip turns its back on the once mighty nation. As it's increasingly isolated on the world stage, the West only grows stronger. Its military expedition into a neighboring nation has gone catastrophically wrong, proving to the world that the military of the once feared superpower is a largely hollow, poorly led and poorly trained force. Now thousands of casualties and even more wounded veterans are adding to the growing voices of dissent from within. But this isn't Russia today, this is the Soviet Union in 1989, just two years before its official collapse. The question is, will modern Russia collapse as its predecessor did, and what would it take to collapse this once mighty nation? The question of collapse is a difficult and tricky one to discuss in relation to Russia. It is almost impossible that the Russian state will simply dissolve, as while there are regions who would make a bid for independence if given the chance, internal cohesion is strong amongst most of the republics that remained within Russia after the end of the Cold War. A collapse of Russia is thus more likely to mean significant economic crash, along with the end of the Putin regime and any possible successor that he might support. So how do we get there? For Russians, a possible collapse is a lot more terrifyingly close than the state media would ever let it be known. Firstly, the war in Ukraine is going to be the chief catalyst in any possible collapse of the current Russian regime. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan led to a decade-long quagmire that sucked up resources and men. Unlike the United States and its own follies in the Middle East, the Soviet Union didn't have the benefit of an incredibly deep pocket and partner nations to fund and support failed military adventurism for years on end. Today, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is increasingly looking like another Soviet Afghanistan, but only much worse. In the Soviet invasion, the United States helped provide training and light weapons to Mujahideen fighters fending off Soviet troops. This resulted in a stalemate, where the Soviets controlled the cities while the Mujahideen controlled the countryside. But there's several fundamental differences between the Afghani Mujahideen and modern Ukraine. The first is that Ukraine already had an organized Western-style national military when the war began in February 2022. By comparison, the Mujahideen were an asymmetric, decentralized force that was largely impossible to coordinate. While this had its strengths in combating the superior Soviet war machine, Ukraine's ability to field a professional military allows it to fight in a coordinated national campaign that has been incredibly successful so far in stopping and even reversing the Russian offensive. It's exactly because Ukraine fields a professional military that heavy weapon assistance can be provided to its armed forces, something that would have been impossible or impractical in Afghanistan. At the start of the war, it was feared that Russia's superior military would quickly overwhelm Ukraine's defenses. This would have made supplying the country with modern military weapons a futile act, as they'd simply be surrendered or destroyed, and not even reach the battlefield in time to matter. However, as Ukraine scores tactical defeat after tactical defeat on Russian forces and even launches counterattacks to reclaim territory, it's become clear to the West that Ukraine has the expertise and numbers to actually stand up to Russia long enough for heavy weapons to make an impact. At first, this meant supplying Ukraine with Cold War systems sourced from unaligned parties or stockpiles of some NATO members. But now, the floodgates are increasingly opening on the supply of modern Western firepower. US HIMARS, Harpoon anti-ship missiles, and counter-battery radars, for instance, have all inflicted disasters upon the Russian military. As other nations join in providing modern equipment to Ukraine, Russia is going to face an increasing number of modern weapon systems. This is something it is woefully unprepared for, both because its military training is woefully inadequate for modern war, and because as the war drags on, it's increasingly relying on Cold War era weapon systems that simply cannot compete versus Western weapons. But new Western arms isn't Russia's only strategic problem, because it's also facing a morale crisis amongst its troops. As casualties mount and progress on the battlefield is measured in meters, Russian troops, many of which are conscripts, are becoming increasingly difficult to manage, at times even to the point of outright sedition. This has forced senior officers to the front lines as their troops are no longer trusted to operate without direct and immediate supervision. And in turn, this has led to staggering numbers of casualties amongst its senior officer corps, with as many as 14 generals and 56 colonels killed since the war began. As senior military echelons are thinned out, Russia's military loses what little expertise it had to begin with, leading to increased breakdown in command and control and increasingly deficient performance. It's difficult to get unbiased polling from Russia, as the nation has banned nearly all independent media when the war began to turn for the worse. But while the majority of Russian people seem to support the war right now, as it continues to drag on and military disasters pile on, their support will only last so long. 
Vladimir Putin will also soon have to deal with thousands upon thousands of returning veterans, many of them wounded and maimed, who are deeply unhappy with the war. This should sound like a familiar scenario to Putin, as it is exactly how the Bolsheviks helped launch their own revolution, which saw the imperial government ousted from power. But if there is a silver lining to the scenario for Putin, it's that there is no major dissenting political power within Russia. A student of history, Putin has purged any would-be opponents and dismantled any political opposition to his rule for over two decades. What remains is a small movement for true democracy, but without an influential leader to help coordinate it and fan the flames of revolution. By murdering and imprisoning his opposition without mercy, Putin might have helped avert his own overthrow from power. Yet, Russia remains a pressure cooker, and the pressure is only piling up. Even as you watch this episode, Ukrainian troops are being trained in the West to use modern weapon systems being provided to them in increasing numbers. The US has even helped finance the training of new Ukrainian soldiers in Western nations, where they can receive expert Western training and complete safety from Russian attack. As the war drags on, Ukraine's proficiency only increases, while it's obvious that Russia's own is in continuous decline. Even its stockpiles of smart weapons are all but depleted, with only those held in reserve in case of war against NATO remaining. To punctuate the point, it's been reported that Russia has been using S-300 air defense missiles in ground attack mode, a move of sheer desperation. If mounting casualties isn't enough to collapse the public support for the war, then a military defeat is sure to. Ukraine is currently incapable of inflicting such a defeat on Russia, but if the war continues for years, as many predict it will, the probability of Ukrainian victory becomes ever greater. If Putin's war machine suffers a humiliating defeat and forced retreat in Ukraine, it'll mean the political end of Putin and his regime. And he knows this, which is why some fear that he might resort to weapons of mass destruction if such a defeat seems likely. But using a nuclear weapon or large numbers of chemical weapons in Ukraine may mean a collapse of the Putin regime anyway. If Russia were to launch such an attack, the nation will be completely isolated internationally, as it becomes a pariah state. As damaging as current sanctions are, they will pale in comparison with the economic and political price to be paid for using weapons of mass destruction. On the topic of sanctions, these too might pave the way for a political collapse of the Russian government. To date, Russia has seen some of the toughest sanctions placed on a nation in recent history. Yet, the Russian economy seems to be weathering these sanctions very well. In fact, in July, the Russian ruble hit its strongest level since May 2015, when it hit a high of 52.3 versus the dollar. This resurgence after the collapse prompted by sanctions actually led to the central Russian bank to try to weaken the ruble on purpose so as to keep their exports competitively priced. As Russian President Vladimir Putin said, the idea was clear, crush the Russian economy violently. They did not succeed. But is that true? Are sanctions failing and Russia is actually flourishing? Russia's largest source of revenue is its exports of energy, including oil, gas, and coal. With oil prices at historic highs, Russia's exports to the very people trying to sanction it are leaving the country flush with cash. In just the first 100 days of the war in Ukraine, Russia raked in $98 billion in revenue from energy exports, with $60 billion coming from the European Union. Russia is raking in the money hand over fist, giving it the ability to artificially prop up its economy. For the time being, because the EU is dedicated to curbing its imports of Russian energy, in 2020 the EU relied on Russia for 41% of gas imports and 36% of oil imports. But these figures are set to plummet dramatically, as the bloc passed a sanctions package in May aimed at massively cutting imports from Russia by the end of 2022. The United States is helping the European Union wean off Russian energy by finding alternative sources, and even began the process of lifting sanctions from oil superstate Venezuela to encourage diplomatic talks aimed at fully lifting sanctions. The US has also worked with OPEC members to increase oil production and help relieve pressure on the EU. As the world moves away from Russian energy and into alternate sources, including renewables, its ability to bring in foreign money is going to drop year over year. If this war lasts for years, as it seems set to, Russia could see a major source of foreign revenue dry up over time and this will be particularly harmful to the Russian economy, because the unprecedented sanctions levied against Russia leave it largely unable to conduct international trade. Further damning Russia is the fact that its economy has never been well diversified, relying on the energy sector for the majority of its GDP. The enactment of strict capital controls also help limit damage to the ruble from Western sanctions. By limiting the ability for Russian money or foreign reserves to leave the country, the ruble has remained artificially propped up. Yet this is a temporary measure at best, as it literally strangles an economy and cuts it off from global markets. 
There is also the matter of Russia's currency reserves, which number at over 600 billion when the war started, though approximately half of that was frozen in overseas accounts in retaliation for the invasion of Ukraine. This war chest has been built up over the years from profits made by the energy trade and been held in strategic reserve for exactly the situation Russia finds itself in today. Now the money left in its reserves is helping prop up the economy artificially and continue to help pay for the war in Ukraine. Yet these reserves will eventually run out, and when they do, Russia will find itself in dire straits. All of these factors have led many to call the ruble a Potemkin currency. Named for the fake villages made to create the illusion of prosperity for Russian Empress Catherine the Great, a Potemkin currency is one whose real value is being artificially propped up and which will inevitably collapse when those supports are no longer available. But the ruble's value is not a good indicator of economic health anyway, as Russia faces unemployment rising to 7% this year. With thousands of international companies pulling out of the country, foreign investment in the nation has plummeted to the lowest level since the end of the Cold War. This has left many Russians without jobs and struggling to find one amidst a stagnant economy. This pullout of international companies, however, comes with even greater repercussions, as Russia now faces a massive shortage of many goods and services that modern life relies on. Boeing and other commercial jet aircraft manufacturers like Airbus have stopped supplies of spare parts to the nation's air fleets and canceled maintenance contracts. This is quickly leading to the collapse of Russia's airline industry, as it's forced to cannibalize planes for parts in order to keep an ever-shrinking fleet in the air. It's also creating a massive safety hazard that could soon see Russian air travel the most dangerous in the world, because it's not just cut off from critical replacement parts, it also lacks the ability to manufacture them itself. Russia's poorly diversified economy is its own worst enemy, and as the nation has been cut off from international markets for high-technology products, it's struggling to maintain modern tools and equipment. We already have reports from Ukraine that Russian missiles are being equipped with scavenged microprocessors from civilian appliances due to an embargo by Taiwan, the world's largest manufacturer of electronic components. Just two months into the war, Russia was forced to close down the Ulyanovsk Mechanical Plant, a facility responsible for producing surface-to-air missiles. Because Russia imported nearly all of the electronic components required, production ground to a halt as supplies ran out. Its workers were given a choice – go home on unpaid indefinite leave or join the Russian war in Ukraine at a salary of $600 US a month. This is typically quickly followed by a permanent retirement. It's a story playing out all over Russia in both the military and civilian sectors. We know that supplies of Western-sourced medicines are at critical levels and in some places completely out. Some Russian families have been forced to accept that there is no treatment available for life-threatening conditions due to sanctions. Consumer prices on the whole have risen nearly 20%, with inflation expected to hit as high as 23% as estimated by Russia's central bank. There will likely be some stabilization in certain segments of the Russian economy as the shock of sanctions is absorbed and markets readjust, but Russia's economy is doomed doomed to shrink significantly. As it stands, the economy is expected to shrink by a whopping 15% this year, wiping out 15 years of growth, with a further 3% reduction in 2023. Eventually it'll stabilize, but without a doubt Russia will be a shadow of its former self as a result. Perhaps one of the most difficult effects to measure in the near term, however, is Russia's demographic problem. The first part of this problem is Russia's ongoing brain drain, intensified in the last few months by its invasion of Ukraine and the exodus from Russia of intellectuals, artists, professionals, and youth. By mid-March, an estimated 200,000 Russians had left the country due to fear of reprisals for not supporting the war or of how bad the domestic situation would get in the long term. Since then, an accurate number is difficult to source, but some estimate that as many as a million might have left the country, and that exodus continues. Russia's problem is that many of those fleeing the Putin regime are exactly the people that a modern economy relies on. In the first month of the war, an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 IT professionals left the nation, and up to 100,000 followed soon after according to Russian IT industry trade groups. Hospitality, legal, consulting, and real estate professionals are also leaving the nation in droves, causing an unexpected brain drain that will make it increasingly difficult for Russia's economy to remain competitive. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's expected that 15,000 millionaires will leave Russia by the end of the year, taking their investment capital with them. So will the Russian government collapse? It's quite possible given the way that die has been cast so far. Vladimir Putin has spent two decades preparing the Russian people for a confrontation with the West and so far spun all the consequences for his own actions as attacks by the West against Russia and Russophobia. In the end, as the situation deteriorates in Russia, it might end up only consolidating his power base and ensuring the survival of his regime. Putin may end up a dictator over a backwater second world nation that's broke, internationally irrelevant, and politically isolated, but at least he'll remain in power. Now go check out what will Ukraine do after the war with Russia, or click this other video instead.